essentially as though the uh, title of this is about a models, from, from models to systems. Actually, what I'm going to do is take that in the other direction because I think it uh, makes more sense to talk first about the uh, general ideas in, in, uh, in systems and then, and then focus later on. So I'm going to start with uh, some very general problems in just the way systems engineering and automation of engineering generally has been going in the last two decades or so. And uh, look, at, look at where the trend is and, and how I think things fit together. That's interesting. Just in this, will this be something that keeps popping up? I hope not. Okay, so I'm going, to, I'm going to just describe a sort of design philosophy or design pattern for design uh, systems and system systems engineering. I'm going to link that to different viewpoints uh, and uh, suggest that it provides a framework for uh, research in designing systems that assist the system systems. I assume you're all familiar with IBM Watson, the program that does Jeopardy. And, uh, interesting thing about Watson is that it's, it's doing some new things. And as, as we're also trying to do, it's doing knowledge intensive sorts of tasks. But uh, as it turns out, it's not a good model for anything but for doing much of the system. Uh, um, I recently saw a lecture by Chris Welty, where some of his key points about Watson was the machine understanding is not interesting. That's, that's reasonable. And also that knowledge is not the destination of a, of a system like Chip, uh, Watson for Jeopardy. In other words, the ability to uh, explain why it is you believe something is not important in you know, Jeopardy. Just get the answer right and move on to the next problem. So though there are these systems that have this capability emerging, some, some really impressive kinds of capabilities, they don't seem to map up well to what, what I think is necessary in requirements engineering, uh, BMP, and systems engineering generally. So um, though I think there's possibly a revolution about to happen, Revolution emerging, I don't think we're part of it. It's not if you're working on BP. Because knowledge is the destination in a lot of Certainly, requirements engineering, you need to understand the relationships between things. Validation, you need a sort of deductive argument as to why things work. So, the kind of systems I'm, I'm concerned with here, minimally, I expect them. Uh, to be able to explain the design space, characterize how how the design space characterize how the design space was was described, and demonstrate how requirements are being met. Um, ideally, you'd like to provide deductive arguments. Your, your system that's it, that's assisted you in doing systems engineering should be able to provide uh, some notion as to why things are the way they are. Why, um, why some sort of uh, selection of components is incompatible with other selections, and possibly even make references to uh, uh, functions or principles of operation. So I'm going to spend a couple slides here to talk about what I'm calling a uh, uh, basis, sort of uh, rationale for every single um, sort of decision you make in system engineering. Now we know on a on sort of macro scale, decision making in system engineering is done by trade studies and simulations and risk assessments, et cetera. On a micro level, 
that is, each one of those trade studies and simulations is based on uh, a set of lower level decisions uh, that helped you prepare the simulation, characterize the design space, et cetera, and, uh, and interpret the results. Okay. So at this lower level, you're looking at a, a web of information that's uncertain, conflicting, and isolated as you start to do engineering. As, as the work in a project evolves, the uncertainty is quantified, the conflicts are resolved, and the interrelationship between viewpoints becomes more understood. So my strategy here is, is to look at that lower level of data that isn't really associated well, it's, it's, each, each part of it is associated with a different viewpoint that is provided by a, a different set of analysis. Finite element analysis and finding a, a certain view of structural uh, error dynamics that is, is taught to look at another one. But to integrate these things, you need to get down to that level of what is actually being said and what it is we believe about this. So here I'm, I'm uh, going to spend a couple slides just talking about a categorization of that kind of knowledge, and I'm not suggesting in that categorization that uh, that it's a way to build systems, but only a way to think about how how systems are built and, and provide that framework for, for building particular instances of it. But only focus on some of these these rationales. So I I'll provide a description of these nine rationales um, that I think are are the sorts of things you think about when you do engineering. Measurement conditions, for example. Uh, measurement conditions are uh, part, of, part of your belief about any particular knowledge is the consideration of how it was measured. The process and environment in which it was measured. And, and for each of these, I'll provide a uh, definition and then sort of an example sentence of the kind of reasoning that uh, associates with that. So for some, some hypothetical here, we have um, capacitance was measured using an AC and P measure condition. Um, this, this second sort of rationale is the logical consistency of some statement with everything else you uh, understand. It may be logical consistency with a theory, for example. Okay, so that's con the confidence you have in the belief due to its consistency with theory or, or type consistency, that it's of a certain type, um, consistent with that type. So we might say this type of hypothetical uh, parameter P is as we expect from, from some law. Now the third one of these, which I call associ uh, associativity across views, is really a key part in system engineering, particularly because you have different, different views that you're trying to integrate. And um, I think we recognize two sorts of associativity that occur. One is at the level of individuals, where in one model you're looking at, uh, say, a, a CAD model, and in another model you're looking at the finite element analysis of that, you're saying, these two things are the same place in the model. We're talking about individuals there that are the same. Okay. Um, another sort of associativity is that of the concepts. We know that um, each, each viewpoint, each model has its own set of uh, concepts associated with that viewpoint. And we want to know whether the concepts in one viewpoint are like the concepts in the other. Can I use those for the same purpose? Precursors, other designs, 
prototypes and so forth. You want to know the relationship between the prototype and or the, the earlier version and what it is you're looking at now. What are the differences? Well, how did how did the two differ? So we might say uh, value of P that was calculated for this design is close to what we found in earlier models. Okay. Uh, authority. Authority is just the notion that you believe in something because you've got it from a source that's, that's credible. So design, manual, and so forth. Um, now number six here, origin and requirements. The idea behind that isn't so much that it's providing support for a belief, but rather that because some property is related to a requirement, you're, you're interested. It, uh, it brings it to light as being something that's important. So now, as we move into these last few, I have to admit some of them you don't see. You don't see you know, theoretical uh, viewpoint, but they're more to do with the organizations where engineering occurs. Every engineering organization has some process for doing designs and so forth, and they have ways of proceeding <coughs> through the design of, of, of some family of products uh, that is repeated for each each instance. And as you as you're doing work, you're asking yourself, well, where did I get this information within within the process that we uh, we do here at the company? Um, consistency with other belief is just uh, this is this is a lot like logical consistency, but for contingent facts. That is where logical consistency has to do with theory, and you're not changing the theory at any point. Say, oh, you know what I said about gravity was not that doesn't hold anything. But uh, other beliefs have to do with how the how the design is evolving. So as as the changes are made, um, certain things become. <coughs> That were true or no longer true, and tracking that is, is something that you do. Now, the, finally, this this one B and B process is the idea of wrap sort of wraps up the other eight and says, in some enterprise that does engineering, they have a B and B process, and in as far as what you're looking at has uh, gone through that process, you believe what you're looking at because because of that you have confidence in the process and how it was carried out in this product. So there's nine rationale. Now that I could have I could have made seven or eleven out of that. There's probably nothing about that particular nine that separates things neatly. Um, I claim that that covers a lot of the, the basis for belief in engineering, but but there's overlap and coupling in the way, any way you try to split these things. So it's not correct. And those are beliefs or the component of the system or the system design, right? Those are rationale for any any belief you hold in the system. Let, let me show you. It probably, um, I, I can maybe explain that a little better through a picture here. On the left side of this picture, you have a description of what occurs in systems engineering as it's described in ISO spec 15288. There's some set of processes for the realization of the system, validation, verification, and so forth. And on the right hand side is a model, model of model based systems engineering itself, where you have model based system engineering, you have models, of course, and meta models. Meta models describe viewpoints, uh, viewpoints and models express views. So this is the relationship between the model and the view and the meta model and the viewpoint. Viewpoint is the notion that um, there's a certain well-formedness to a model that's described by its meta model. For example, a finite element analysis is uh, has to have has to have um, constraints on its uh, degrees of freedom some place in it, so when you put a load on it, it doesn't just swing around and come up with a singularity and matrices and so forth. Um, 
So the viewpoint governs the, the uh, view. Um, I'll, I have some more slides on this kind of idea. Um, but to get back to your idea, what, where, are these, where do these sentences fit in? These, these are, every model is expressing some set of beliefs about the world. What I'm suggesting here is that um, in a program of research, what I do is try to map out of those models into some set of sentences that are first order sentences, first order logical sentences that say the same thing during the model. Okay. Now I've, I've written, I've made some of these relationships read because I, I think some of this needs discussed. Can you say this in what language? Um, first order language, typically. I, so if I wanted to write seven pieces of the system in a particular domain specification language, I have to map it to a general object language? Well, it depends on what you're trying to do. Now, some of the examples I'm going to show, it's not so, it's not so much that I'm doing that. But doing, doing validation, that's, that's a useful way to do it. Because in some of the you had, the domain was different views and you had different domains, yeah? That's right. So, and then when you go to this, to this diagram, which tries to go from the process model and that to some model system, you don't have to do something about models and other models and other specific languages so that you link the sentences to you, right? That's right. Okay, so is that, where is that part? Well, um, the meta model describes the sorts of sentences that would be asserted for a particular kind of instance of the model. Okay, so it's a, it's a, it can be in a example of or done by actually modeling the meta model through another language. First mm -hmm. order language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can show that in a couple more slides too. Mm -hmm. So, um, is OMG uh, trying to do this? Well, OMG is really on this side of things. Well, I'm not exactly sure. No, um, I would say some. Some of us are doing that with the uh, UBT and some of the, uh, that's a mapping language for OMG. Uh, but it's not what, I'm not, what I'm presenting here is not the, the MDA kind of viewpoint. Because I haven't seen, <laughs> it's a nice diagram, but I haven't seen anything like that coming out of OMG. No, no, this is not, this is not really the standards view. Right. This, is, this is towards doing certain kinds of research. But there's a standard, IEEE one four seven one. It's very similar to this diagram, where you start off and you talk about stakeholders, their concerns, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then it links it into viewpoints. And there's a there's a there's a link that's missing in that there's sentences. There's you don't have any concerns, and then you don't somehow the sentences are going to be linked directly around to the viewpoint, then the viewpoint goes to the view and into the models. That part's in the top right-hand side of your diagram, that's consistent with IEEE 14741. Yeah, this, this right here, yeah. Yeah, right, I'm, no, no, I'm no, no, even more, than, even more than that. In the view of the models, <laughs> yes, that's right. a many-to-many -many relationship. Yep. And you've got a one-to-one -one relationship between the viewpoints and the views. I didn't put those, I didn't put the multiplicities in there because I didn't think you guys would study this since I was No, <laughs> yes. no. So it's a link that's missing in your diagram. So which one, which one are you talking about? Which one? From viewpoints, they have to come back, tie, somehow you've got to tie viewpoints back to your sentences. Oh yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. This is not, um, right, there's, there's just like this for the instance, you're, you're asserting an instance. You need, to, you need to model the meta model as a set of sentences. Yeah. I was trying to answer John's question with, yeah. with that. Yeah, you could. I didn't think I'd get into this much detail on this, but that's okay. good. That's good. Happy. I'm okay with that. You put a, a line with the meta model and the sentences and then you get quite different colors red into all of that. Yes. We have the possibility yeah. of the last to answer the question. You know, I, I um, what I wanted to talk about here is how this doesn't quite fit. Well, maybe this isn't an answer to your question in a way, too. That a meta model is not really a logical language. And although I say, well, the meta model is, is 
is a kind of ontology, it's a kind of logical formalism. It, it's not exactly. That's why they call it these things red. So there's some, some work involved with making that and mapping the like meta model view and the ontological view, logic, logic based view. And likewise, these are uh, over simplifications of what's really occurring. You don't have the accept and reject sorts of ideas from processes generally, but specific processes, validation, verification, and, and tasks you run within those. What I wanted to focus on here was a little bit more of the, the relationship between the sentence and those nine elements I discussed earlier. In the sense that sentences are supported by other sentences and have that much uh, uh, other belief supported by other belief. Um, the notion of effectivity, belief that uh, some sentence is only true at, at particular times. Okay, so it's, it's a, uh, Every, every sentence talks about a subject and a property, say the subject and the, the, the verb, and uh, some, some uh, description of the quantity that, that uh, is associated with the property. Um, sentences can either be indicative or octave of the class. And I, I have a whole paper on just the relationship between the sentences processes that I reference later. So example uses of this would be in such as in, in DMV, uh, you can do, well actually, let's take one of the requirements engineering. In requirements engineering, as you develop uh, conceptualization of the product, you Insert some set of sentences, and you can use uh, a first order logic kind of description of those things with a truth maintenance system, and and use that to uh, partition your beliefs about things into different alternatives. Um, so they're conting uh, contingent facts in that case, and, uh, and uh, as you do refinement, you're tracking what set of beliefs you, you are holding and which ones are rejected. Okay, um, so I want to I want to move now into the details of exchange form validation. But you know, I think uh, I've got my slides in the wrong order. We should probably talk about this one first. So uh, I'm going to transition from this broad view of system engineering into the kinds of things that this does. And of course, we work a lot with standards. So what I'm trying to convey here is the idea of what, what loops you have to uh, jump through in order to do communication with, with a specification of exchange. So let's suppose that there's some two systems here who want to communicate. They share some environment, and the sending system wants receiving, receiving system to change the environment or respond to it. So they, the people building this system have in their possession a copy of the standard that they're reading. And they, have, they know what sort of behavior they want out of the receiving system. They look at the spec and they say, well, I understand this set of structures to mean this. So if I send this message with those structures in it to the receiving system, he'll respond with the behavior I'm looking for and he'll change the state. Um, so he's using. He, the sending system, is using that specification to prepare a message. On the other hand, the receiving system, these are two guys who, two components who um, don't speak to each other except through the standard. Um, they're interpreting the standard uh, independently by themselves. He receives this message um, because he's read what those structures mean in the specification. He believes it. it Form or it uh, associates with a particular kind of behavior that he performs here. So the, the problem with standards and these specifications is just that the, the uh, behavior you might get um, 
could be, the actual behavior could be different than the one that the sending system wanted just because he misunderstood the relationship between, or he had a different interpretation of the relationship between the message structure and what behavior occurred. So instead of getting um, behavior you wanted, you get some other behavior. But then why can't he send you back in the particular? Could, but uh, if we're talking about, if we're talking about the, uh, Change the UML model. It's not. Uh, it, it's not a system of, of so much of tightly bound components, but just two guys who are trying to pass a model to each other. Yeah, but the model you would have some sort of uh, the more general thing that you think of abstracting would be like a transformation, right? Or a generalization of some. Uh, well, um, the abstraction. So are you just talking about something like a you know diagram I hang together in Visio or what are you talking about? Yeah, uh, let's say a UML diagram that I put together with a UML tool. Right. Uh, I have two different UML tools here. One so isn't there an element of trust in this? So what? Isn't there an element of trust in this? Um, if you give me a model and I'm thinking, you know, he doesn't know what I was talking about. I'm he doesn't know what your diagram looks like. I'm, not, I'm going to be very slightly wrong. Yeah. It came from Vizio. Yeah, but, but what we're really interested in here is is just mapping into a set of structures that you're programming with. So if I have two UML tools, there, one of them has some set of internal structures that serializes in XMI. Send the XMI file to the other guy. He's right. got to read that file and, and create some set of uh, diagram elements internal to this tool that match them. Okay, so if I had some diagram up in the center view, uh, I want to reproduce that in, in the other. So it's just it's it's it could be two engineering firms working together talking through this UML file. So how do you resolve this? Because they have to agree before they can proceed with the system. So the yeah. behavior is different. First of all, how do you know it's different? And how do you resolve it in these two problems? You have a program of You must have some way of taking the, the, the device simulation. What is it? It's, it's, it's the model interchange working that gets together and does test cases for these different kinds of models. Right, right. But I mean, <coughs> whatever answer you give me, there has to be some formalism by which I execute this to figure out if I have to worry about this. Uh, First of all, if the behaviors are similar enough from the perspective it matters to the system or not. Because maybe the behaviors are different, but as far as their impact on the overall system, it doesn't matter. That's right. Okay. And that's actually you want because this gives you variability in components and more selection than the individual partners of the overall system. Right. If I had only one, one unique solution every time I have a behavior discussion, it would be in trouble if I have a hundred people in the of that thing. Right. We would never match itself. Well, we we describe the meta model for, right. for that um, exchange in a way that everyone agrees. They agree what the terms, the objects mean in the meta model. So, but do um, you agree also on the way of taking? Um, Whether the behavior is different enough, or it's okay, or whatever. Well, it, it, I think that depends on the particular. Um, sure. Program. Right. So, with the case of uh, UML models, as we've done, it's a question of just getting diagram roughly so it looks like what the other guy sent. It has to be it has to be just describing the, the same model. set of facts. What I'm saying is behind the UML model, especially in more recent work, right, there is a logical model that's pretty complete. Right. And if I get your message from upstairs and I'm down here and I bring my my diagram, you know there's a diagram, there's a program described that. And you have your own program described your diagram. Right. So so you go back to the the logical view, right? right. The logical view, you create a, a collection of sentences from the model. That should okay. be able to check as to where it stands. Right. The, the, the logical view, the model is also a set of inferences that right. are valid for that, for that kind of model. So whatever I send, it should be possible to infer a particular um, set of, set of other sentences from that. Whether I sent those sentences or not, 
we should be able to infer the same set of facts from that. Let me back up. The purpose of this, right, of, of this slide and this diagram is to solve problems that arise when different organizations would use the same tools, try to cooperate in the design of the system and they change models. Is that? That's right. So, okay, so you saw that's how somebody creates a model and sends somebody else. But then how do you get to the point where they are okay and they can proceed? Do you think about that? I mean, what's the purpose? Okay, so suppose I get the the model, I look at it, and then what do I do? I create my model, do I send it back, do I send it, what do I do? What are these two do? Well, in, in this case, there um, this is an example of simple communication. If I say pick up this end of the table, right. pick up your end of the table. And you do something other than pick up the table, and you don't understand me, right? But how, so, how do I figure out? How do I synchronize my thinking or my logic or whatever? Well, it's, it has to do not with the semantics thing, but the pragmatics. Is the it? fact that the fact that there's some set of behaviors associated with my message that that you did. Now, that, that pragmatics of, of this we test with the model interchange working group, for example, is you can produce that diagram. A diagram that has the same set of facts behind it. Okay. And these diagrams communicate back? Um, it doesn't matter. This is just changing, exchanging diagrams in some engineering environment. I'm just trying to, to figure out in this setup where the diagrams are set, whether they're the same, similar, similar enough, or whatever. That's through a testing program, which okay. I'm going to talk about next. Right. So, I'm going to assume you guys have a sense of meta model pretty well understood. Right, right, right. But let's uh, let me talk. Let me provide a definition of meta model and then show you how it fits with the uh, notion of exchange. So I'm calling the meta model a specification form of model, the well formalization, and it's a formalization of the viewpoint that the models express. Okay, so. Meta models then are useful in doing model exchange because uh, the definition of the structures tells you how to serialize things. So, well, these are things you have classes, associations, and so forth. Those are things you know you're going to have to serialize into something in exchange models. On the other hand, because this meta model shows me what viewpoint is all about, the 1471, I just believe the sense of the viewpoint I'm talking about here, then it illuminates how you map those structures into your into your program, or map them out into the exchange model. Spent uh, a year and a half running a program that used 10 or 
16 test cases. And um, I think it was pretty well agreed that uh, when we started the very low uh, interoperability among these tools, when we finished, things were quite good. Um, I'm not sure that this graph quite ex ex describes that, uh, the level of success we've seen, but uh, and I, I probably have to go through this a little bit. But as you can see, uh, early on, we, we had lots of bugs that we, we fixed in the early test cases as we went, uh, went on a little bit more. So some of the test cases were uh, difficult and surprising, so uh, as we finished, there were still lots of discrepancies uh, that needed to be resolved. Uh, towards the end, things, most, most uh, of the six, uh, six products that were using them Part of the model that you were we're, we're, we're we're changing the model. <coughs> so, so just to be clear here in the previous lecture, so are you creating like 16 different types of UML-like diagrams and testing them in validating them against a schema? So you're validating them against a reference file. So, so you have a you have a, a picture of the class diagram, the test case one, right. okay, and you have a reference <coughs> file that says this is the this is the work, this is the this is the right set of objects that should be in that model. Key, but key those objects will be described by a schema. The, the meta model. Yeah. That's so you are you validating against the schema? Is the schema for all the 16 case cases the same? Uh, no. Why not? Well, for uh, some of those problems are, are UML models and some of them are system. Oh, that's fair enough. Okay. Right. And when there's different versions of UML. So what the tool does, in this tool, my tool reads reads the meta model, compiles it, compiles the OCL in it, um, and then tests against the OCL and, um, and the structure of the file. So, uh, so what's the approximate division? I mean, a half of the UML, half of the system model, I think uh, 11 were UML, 5 were system how different is um, the scheme? SysML is actually a, a specialization sort of thing, you know, technically. Uh, the SysML um, spec doesn't have a whole lot of actual formal constraints in it, unfortunately. So, um, so a lot of the testing had to, had to do with uh, human interpretation of what should have been in the model. So I think SysML could be improved through additional OCL constraints, a set of formal constraints that, uh, what, but I think we're still pretty, pretty happy with, with the results because uh, with, with six vendors each producing the, the same thing, even, even if the formal method and tools aren't, uh, aren't showing the differences, we can still talk these things over identify the um, differences manually and work through the problems. It's at least more than you're supposed to describe the same other one. No, 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 it could be anything. Each one could be different. So, so, so you said about the label where you are now, so did you have structure and behavior or what? Uh, yeah, there was uh, structures and sequence diagrams. So we, very covered about, we covered about 70% of the metamodel objects of UML. And uh, I would think about 60% of system. Because there's always some set of things that aren't all that used. So, Um, with that piece of work, what we did was what I would call meta model based validation. But there's in fact two ways to do the validation. Uh, and in other projects I've done, uh, I've used this axiomatic approach. In the axiomatic approach, you really do write out to a first order language. Okay? And uh, in doing that, 
you can use a common first order reasoner like proof or nine to identify faults. Now, as it happens with first order, whenever there's any contradiction in a set of axioms, you can uh, you can prove anything. Okay. So it's like using an indirect proof where there's already faults in there. And so there's a, that's an advantage in the sense that I don't have to write a lot of constraints uh, manually. I can, I can just use the ontology if, if there is one and um, do the validation through that process. Uh, the problem is interpreting that, that set of results can be unusual. If, if the contradiction is somewhere in the ontology that has nothing to do with your test case, it's still going to be drawn into the proof in some bizarre way, and it, that makes it difficult to see exactly what's happening. The meta model thing that we did with the uh, model interchange working group on the other hand has these direct structural checks in it, and an OCL that explicitly looks for particular things. The nice thing about that is those things that you're looking for are in the exchange form. The problem is the constraints of the plain code. Understand whether they are actually whether the code is actually interpreted. But you could do a combination of them. Yes, you could. This is actually what you would do in practice. Um, because some of the axiomatic stuff will come from the logic of the design in the, in the particular engineering domain that you are. And then the second part, you know, the things you can't have to make go about it, you know, check things that they are not they are not so certain from the rules. Yes, you can use the combination. You can in in uh, a strong industrial setting where you really do have you can put that work into it. Is the first one the axiomatic? Uh, can I do the axiomatic from design actions? Like for instance, if you look at uh, Namsu's axiomatic theory design and so on and so forth, the multiple makers and all of that, can I map that there? I don't see why not. You know, I think about it. He started this whole right. movement towards a geometric design, because he was a mechanical engineer, and he was in the same way, and he, he started to capture actions of design from different you know, mechanics, natural mechanics, and so forth. But, but I don't think they were able, this is all that, but then they were not able to link to this kind of tools and logic. Right. Um, and that was, you know, you can bump up against the constraints of uh, the reasoners pretty quick, and I'm not. I wouldn't suggest that you could actually do. Uh, but you can go from design. above to below, from above to below, right? Because yes, you do. if I explain my actions in some logical way, I can translate these constraints, right? And then I can bring them back here, yeah. and then if I have some linkage between the two, I can explain them, right? Now. That, that I think today that's fine if we're doing preliminary design and simple kinds of toy problems. But um, you know, the typical uh, industrial design problem now we have tens of thousands of these facts, and, and it's bound to have uh, contradictions. But you're not going to do them all at once. You're going to, you're going to divide them over like that. Yeah. yeah, that's true. And but people people have tried to do these uh, things with with matrix systems and notions of pure consistency, where they say, well, I'm just going to suspend the fact that there's constraints or, or contradictions for that and try to reason about the things below. Well. But, but it gets difficult pretty quick. And a lot of these things don't want to work with uh, first order logic. They just, like the, the two remaining systems, will only handle uh, proposition So I find, I find the validation validation role is you know, that's, that's a, something you can do with the reasoners. Whether I would actually do design with it is really, it's really hard to say. So, so you don't believe you can do most great based programming uh, with uh, uh, the design of the design? You way to Well, yeah, you, you know, see, that's <coughs> what I was suggesting with that design, the DOL diagram mapping in your senses is 
is that there's a number of different research projects that you can perform just by using meta models and mapping of these sentences. And if you've got an efficient way to do constraint satisfaction problems, then you've got the right kind of problem. You're ready to go. And one more word, one more question. In meta modeling, when we looked into here, uh, there are various ways to do meta models, and there are two kinds of meta problems. So the answer we use to try the meta models, and then how is the meta modeling framework going to be easy to handle the various kinds of models that we can use? Yeah. And we found all kinds of variations in different examples of meta models, and we have a lot of respect to the process center, center good properties with respect to one, but there is a problem with respect to the others and so forth. And the issue of the issue of adding one more model to another framework and the context of that goes on. Yeah. Um, yeah where, but where, the alternatives the where alternatives. is the research in this area trying to build meta modeling environments and how to compare meta modeling environment A to meta modeling environment B with respect strictly of engineering design. A lot of it, I think, is in industry. Um, when, when I talk like? to uh, Rockwell Collins, when I talk to them, for example, okay. um, they tell me that 10, 10 years ago, they spent a lot of time with, with vendors and these different tools trying to get certain principles into the tools. And, and just had, it just takes a long time. And in, and in doing that, they're revealing some of their own trade secrets that they did not like to express. So when Eclipse came along, Here's a way to take these meta models and, and get things done yourself. So um, they find that it's quicker, um, it's more hands-on, and as time goes on, they'll build some competency themselves in, in, in doing these things. So there are, I there, are some the stand, there are some standard things we can do. Standard things of what? Stop standard meta models environment like we do with the still mind, the still more clone, and the coding that comes from them, so this is pretty much the same any recommendation you can give, you can give us as far as what? Well, you see, the set of tools I use, I, I would use, I would, the things that I show now, I wrote in common list years before the Eclipse environment was ready to go. And I have, I have full MOF kind of meta modeling, and QVT, and OCL, and these set of, set of tools around them for mapping languages and so forth, that now you can get in, in Eclipse. So I would just say, Kinds of things, with the kinds of things I'm doing, I would just use Eclipse now, but I have a legacy of all these. Um, so that's a, actually, that leads into what I'm about to talk about now, and, and that is I had this set of tools that do meta modeling, and I showed you how I use this model and change working group. These two other things that I'll very quickly show you that we do with those. One is in the supply chain. Just a simulation. And this, the idea here was that I wanted to show um, the value of models in an enterprise sort of setting. That is, the, uh, suppose some enterprise has a process model, a set of models about how they do ordering and so forth. This is a way I can combine those things quickly to come up with analytical tools for doing simulation that resembles the way they actually do it because they're using those models. Uh, so this uh, this research does just that by uh, I do a mapping from a BPMN model into uh, a discrete event simulation engine um, and also some UML for, for uh, orders and um, map that into a set of uh, demands and so forth. Um, the, the basic idea is, is let's imagine what round trip engineering for supply chain logistics would be. Well, you have these models, and the, the supply chain is operating. It's producing uh, it's producing data from which you build uh, simulations. You, just, you do the simulation. You, know, you produce some insight into the supply chain, and you re-engineer the models, which reflect both uh, the way the enterprise is going to operate and the way the next set of simulations is going to operate. Um, I had what I believe is a fairly elaborate example here that I, I worked with industry, um, some with Toyota, some with Caterpillar, uh, 
So what I've done is, this is a, a BPM model. This is just half of it. There's the three that ship to the supplier, the freight forwarder, and the ocean carrier. Each has a task. Some of these things um, I've sort of stereotyped. We use the UML lines there with uh, stochastic variables. Uh, and then uh, there's logic in here that I've modeled with OCL that uh, makes road change uh, decisions. Probably the next slide shows that. Yeah, down here, for example, uh, will the shipment be delayed? Here's a set of OCL that says, well, yes, it is. Then uh, don't send it by boat, send it by, uh, by plane. Uh, and then later on, it, I do another test after it comes off the plane or boat. Um, does it, uh, is it, is it gonna, still going to be late? Then put it on a truck versus put it on rail. Um, so this is an example of using the meta models and sentences that I generate from those things to do a simulation. And this is just an example of some of the logic generate. There's some results what they call one-term rules that just looked at whether it's going to be late. Two-term rules to say, is it so late that I should forget about it? Because you don't want to put it on a, you don't want to put it on a plane if it's, if it's going to be late anyway. They probably have to work around it. And then no expediting the guidance where there's just no rules. Um, so finally, the project I'm working on now is called Collaborative Requirements Engineering. And I don't have much to say about that at this point because I don't have um, I don't have any results yet. But uh, what I, I intend to do there is demonstrate how you use product data sheets, which are characterizations of equipment, for um, doing requirements engineering and mapping those to simulations, doing this so that the simulations have relevance with respect to this. Suggesting conclusion here that uh, this way of mapping in sentences is going to be the main part of B and B and the requirements engineering for some time to come. This might be the answer to things like Watson or just in a different kind of space here. Um, and in preparing that low level of set of sentences stuff, it's useful to have um, meta models.
through that to be able to describe the standards more rigorously. So how was your experience with Toyota and Caterpillar? Was this to me, this was imperative. Even, I understand it was for shipping and all that stuff, and the product was not a technical design, but uh, well, if you were did they have people that could use it, understand it, work with you? Oh, absolutely. Um, we worked with Toyota and the AIAG, um, and they, they provided a lot of data. Um, a lot of the problem, more description, description of the problem and the way that they're approaching it. Um, we worked with Caterpillar after our AIAG MOS project to, um, to actually apply the, the MOS ideas these trade collaboration systems, as we call them, to uh, their their setting, and uh, I got into a lot of detail with them. I, I used to go out to, to uh, their, their plants once a month for, for six months and spend like three or four days just looking through on how they did the IT and stuff like those things. And, uh, in the end, we we identified uh, some problems and. Probably they adopted maybe 10 or 20 percent of what the Moss project was doing, but uh, you know, it, was, it was useful, I think, to both of us. There are lots of people in the room. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, one building, and you're one of them, so please. Buildings. <laughs> and then the initial building, that's a huge well, problem area related to everything you talked about. I know, I mean, yes. But ask yeah. your question first, I didn't want to interrupt you. Right, so. Yes, my question is about the two methods you mentioned for validation, the same form of validation, the axiomatic and the meta model. Uh, actually, when you have a model, right, uh, the model is being produced using a language, model language. So this is, and the language is being used or is being written based on the meta model, a language. But the content of the model that comes from a specific domain, and the domain itself has its own world. I think that's where the axiomatic approach here is useful. So for a model to be really, for, to validate the model, you need to look at both sides, normally. And at this point, you were talking earlier about the combination of what approaches. So what uh, do you think are the challenges, actually, in combining those two approaches be able to have an efficient validation and the efficient validation process. Uh, how well, yeah. That's a good question because you know you can take you can take an OMG style meta model and just put up and just generate automatically from it a set of first order sentences to just say what's what's in it, the structure of it. That, uh, the class has a properties, so some set of properties associated as as attributes and so forth. The question is, what what can you do with that? Is that um, is that something that is is that a form that is amenable to integration with other viewpoints? I don't think so. So um, the kinds of the kinds of things I seek to do is to look at the same time when I'm mapping it is, is look at an upper ontology like the, the uh, suggested upper sumo, suggested upper merged ontology. There's a there's a piece of that you can pull in and say, when I when I model out of this meta model, I'm going to map into this this kind of general viewpoint, and I'll do that for every other meta model that I'm um, going to use, so that I bring some um, regularity to how they're mapped. Isn't there a mediation problem in the end somehow you, oh yeah, it doesn't come across. Like, it, it, yes. You know, I mean, if, if, if you make a new ML model and say you're an actor, you, and on your diagram, you'll use certain terms. And you give it to me, and I'm an engineer, okay? We could be talking about this thing here, and using completely different words to describe exactly the same thing. Well, this is an interesting point, because I put up all these UML diagrams. None of those diagrams are the way UML is intended to be used. UML is a language for for modeling software. You know, it's got, it's got hooks in there for but, but that, modeling that doesn't, That's an excuse. That doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Because you, you can be... You know, you we can both be writing software, and you can use your language, described language, the software in your language, and my language. The fact that software does not matter. You have the same problems. I mean, this is why you have Unicode, so that you can write your software in Korean, and I can write it in English. 
That's why. That's why Unicode exists. Yeah. So, so well, the, the if we're going to software that does not matter. The, the point is, if we're going to if we're going to collaborate, there's some set. Oh. Of, you're wrong. If, if we're going to collaborate, there's some set of um, objects about which we have to agree. Right. The objects that we're talking about, we have to agree on what what they mean to a degree. We have to we have to. Um, there's some set of inferences that we both understand to be part of that. Now, that's the, the picture, a very basic picture I showed about the sending system and the receiving system, so how to get that idea across. Um, there's some work, for example, by uh, Michael Gruninger, where he takes what he calls the ontological stance on these things. He says, for any of these, any kind of uh, application, um, I'm going to produce the ontology by which it reasons and the behaviors that uh, it is, it, it's likely to uh, be able to communicate are described through those things. So when he talks about um, assessing how two things can communicate, he's actually mapping over the top of the, of the systems an ontological view that isn't there. That's the, but isn't that the integration problem? It's an integration problem. The integration problem, no, that's, that's going beyond the integration problem. Because the integration problem only concerns the parts that you're going to communicate about. Not just not all, not and the other problem is a big problem because you cannot, in these situations, real engineering, what, a, what is your exchange model of, of variables and models? It's not common. In software, it is common. Whether it's Korean or Chinese or Greek, the software models are the same, and you can touch them with EML. In engineering, I claim you cannot. That's why I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> And that's the whole problem that I have in play, though. Because if you really do engineering, right, the logics and everything else is not necessarily mappable to the same, they're not mappable to each other. This is, this is actually helps, my, my premise there that we're not like Watson is really saying that there's not a whole lot of English language you can map into engineering thoughts, right? A lot of times you have, you have curves, right? You have a whole, a whole bunch of geometric models and things that you have in your mind that aren't going to be mapped in, into some formal language. Semantic, you know, semantic. Yeah, some semantic. I try not to use that. Semantic is different. It, it's, it, it's not going to be as easily mapped in as, as is the web content for doing uh, Jeopardy. It's, uh, it, I have a much easier, uh, much easier criticism of what I take for that term my student. <laughs> CPU, you can have memory. Don't make the fundamental mistake of uh, think of the fast and fast CPU, and fast memory in the CPU. So, uh, CPU means you can reason, okay, you can argue, you can think. Just because you can record a lot of things from fast memory, you can't answer the after a fast test, doesn't mean you're smart. I mean, there's nothing to mean. You can fake it, but you won't pass the test. But that's where a bunch of is efficient. And there are Exactly this one. Watson can remember and find things fast, but cannot think. Yeah, I think. I, mean, I think it has. And in engineering, we need to think. We need to be able to have the fundamental principles of the physics and the various things embodied in this logic, so that when you go and say, "Let me do this," and then, ah, you cannot do that because you violate X, Y, Z rule. And that's why what Leonard and I were saying that combined with the axiomatic with the uh, thing, I, I think, is the way to go. Well, particularly the kinds of decisions you do. Uh, you could, now they're using Watson to do medical diagnostics, right? That, oh, that's, that <laughs> but the idea behind that is, well, to me, that, that makes more sense than engineering because it's that one-off kind of thing. In engineering, if you're going to, you, you create a design and then you, you bet the company on it, really. I mean, if it's wrong and you can't explain why, yet you've, Spend, you know, bet the comp company on to build these things and, and, and it didn't work. Exactly See, what you're talking about? The, reason the, for the, the reason for the deductive, you know, the, the reason why you want a deductive answer to exactly. these questions is because in the end, it's very important to you. And, and it may also be required by um, regulation, right? Um, and building a nuclear power plant, you have a huge amount of documentation you have to create. Um, it would be nice if the system assisted, in, assisted you in creating that documentation tracking not just a set of models, but a set of um, 
validation of what you make it. You look at the what happened with Boeing, right? It was a miracle uh, airplane. Uh, I read so much about it, I was not afraid of it. Then they got the problem with the battery, all right? And now they cannot figure out where the problem is. Is it in the battery itself, the construction? Is it because the VMS system is creating overheat? Is it because of the monitoring system? Is it about the control? Where is it? See, there are three disciplines involved. And you can't figure out where the fault is because of this kind of issues. So I mean, somewhere in the process of designing the system, something was lacking in the logic and the test was never made. So now you cannot raise it back. In software, it's never happened. If you take any piece of software, you create a new model, especially for new methods in course and semantics, and then you can map the one to the other as far as the execution of the, the program is going to be exactly the same. Not even the new. What, what is tolerance? So that can somebody explain to me? <coughs> Where is the level, the, the, the concept of tolerance in software and problems? And it's so fundamental in the You cannot have a program that is random unless it can design it. Okay? Yeah, that's not to say that there's some, there could be some character, <coughs> component that you characterize with, with tolerance. So we'll have a round table and two here. Those of you who uh, you know who you are and are interested in these topics, let's come and have more informal discussion because this is very, uh, very important. Topic. And especially, I want to have some discussion about buildings because there are one, two, three, four, about six of us interested in buildings. And there are so many you know, components of the building, so many views. And unfortunately, what I'm finding is that many of the so-called building design groups do not use anything like this. Yet we advocate that something like that could be built, right? at least in a group. So, Peter, here I'm going to argue, we can talk about this. Let's take the speaker again.